Hey, if you guys have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, we are going to be in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, give you an opportunity to, to turn there. Um, we'll have the main text on, uh, on the TV screens up front, but if you don't have a Bible, we have several around here, some up front, some by our like, offering baskets, some in the back. Um, again, like if you don't have a Bible, please grab one, take one. Um, if you forgot yours at home or whatever, you're more than welcome to use these. If you don't have one at home, like keep it. It would do, it'd be greatly appreciated for you guys to take one of these Bibles and, and use it and read it. Um, it, it I'm, I'm excited because we have several like new faces, visiting um, faces, and man, that, that always gets me excited. Um, I know that there are some that are here just visiting family and some who are just here because someone invited them or, or whatever it might be. Um, our, our method of, of, just of, of Sunday morning teaching and, and really, for the most part, Wednesday night, it, it's, it's pretty simple, I, I think, in that we just kind of walk verse by verse through books of the Bible. Um, it's not, we don't chase after topics, which there's nothing wrong with topics. There's, every once in a while, we'll, we'll, there might be something that we need to address and we'll, we'll talk about it. But, but man, we, we just simply just try to walk through Scripture and walk through the Bible um, not complicate things and just see what God has for us to grow that way. Um, when, when there are things, as we approach topics in scripture, we'll talk about them, but we don't necessarily navigate towards them um, unless we get there in scripture. And, and the book of Mark for me has been, it's, it's been an encouragement for me. Um, we've spent several weeks now just kind of talking about different things and and in some regards, one of these kind of reoccurring themes that we see um, is storms in life. And, and that's something that we all probably like share in common. Uh, there, there are going to be struggles. There, there are going to be difficulties. There, there, there are bumps in the road. Like that's just, that's, that's part of living in a broken, fallen world. That's just, it's, it's, it's part of life, right? And, and just because we have a relationship with Jesus doesn't make us immune to that. Like there are, there, there is, I believe some very false teaching going around that says like, if you experience hardships, if you experience difficulties, it's because you lack faith. It's because you lack whatever. And, and, and I don't think that's, that's right. Like, I don't know how you can read the Bible and walk away with, with that interpretation, right? Like, like Jesus faced difficulties. Like the disciples faced difficulties. Like that's just part. I mean, every Old Testament prophet faced difficulties, right? And so it, that's that's part of that's part of it. Um, what separates it, or what makes things different for us as we go through those difficulties, is that we have Jesus with us, and so we we've been able to see Jesus at work in the midst of these difficulties. And hopefully, as 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 you're going through those difficulties. Um, these things that we've talked about have been encouraging to you. Um, today we're going to see a, a, a little something a little bit a, a little different. And um, if you recall, the last like two chapters, Jesus and his disciples have been like away from Israel. Like they, 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 this is like the only time in Jesus's real ministry that that he leaves and he goes into Gentile territory. And we don't know how long he was there. He's probably there two three months, but we don't know exactly how long he's there. And in the midst of that, like he's spending some time with, with his disciples, he's pouring into them. Um, as you look at a timeline, we're not very far removed from when Jesus will be taken to the cross, right? So, so his, his earthly ministry really is kind of, it's, 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 it's coming towards its end. And so he's, he's, he's pouring into these disciples. But in the midst of that, we see these really cool couple stories where Jesus is, is doing things for Gentiles. Now, again, just to help us remember, understand, especially if you're not familiar with this, when you read the Bible, especially in the New Testament, there's, there's kind of two groups of people that, that are identified. You have, you have Jews and Gentiles, all right? And so we can't necessarily look at it as like nationalities per se, but, but the way the Bible looks at it is Jews were those who, who, who fell into the camp that they, they were the, of you know, God's chosen people, but they were, were, they were the ones that, that believed that, that Jesus was, or God was the only, only God, right? Um, and so we have them, but then every other, every other group of people outside of the Jews were called Gentiles, so a very broad term for, for individuals who were, who were outside of, of the Jews, okay? And so we see these two groups, and, and this, this territory that Jesus goes to is a predominantly Gentile area, a very like pagan, like 
very Roman area, okay? And Jesus goes there, and we see him perform a miracle. Um, he heals the one woman's daughter who is possessed by a demon. And, um, and then we see, um, last week we spent a good portion talking about Jesus feeding the 4,000. Don't get it confused with the 5,000. Jesus feeds the 4,000. Again, separate miracles. This was uh, to a Gentile audience in a Gentile territory. And, and again, part of what we see Jesus doing in, in a small scale here is he's showing people that, that his love um, and, and his salvation extends beyond just the Jews. It's, it's to all people. All right. And he's got a, he loves all, all people. And so, so we, we see that now let's pick up in verse, uh, verse 11. Okay. So Mark chapter eight, starting in verse 11, it says the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into the boat again, and went to the other side. Let's, uh, let's pray real quick. Lord, uh, we, we, just, we love you and we thank you for the opportunity to come to church this morning, to open up our Bibles, to, to read your words, to, to look at stories that, in this case, took place 2,000 years ago, a little more than, and yet we can see truths that still are relevant to today. We, we can see things that, 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 that we fall and that we stumble just like the disciples stumbled with. We can, we can see interactions that you had with, with those who did not believe in you, interactions with, with political leaders, interactions with, with religious leaders. You know, we, we see these, these cool stories where you, you talk with people that had deep relationship with you and with people and individuals who had no relationship. So Lord, I ask this morning that, that you just give me your words, that you give me your heart, that you give me your passion for all that is said. Lord, all that we talk about, may, may you be glorified above everything else. Holy Spirit, I ask that you work in a great way. We love you, Lord. We thank you for all that you do in your, our lives. It's a beautiful and precious name we pray. Amen. All right, so we, we see this, this scene, right? And, and we're reintroduced to another group of people that, that we've seen throughout the study of, of Mark, right? And when you go through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you, you see Jesus routinely having interaction with this group called the Pharisees. Now, you could go over in a moment, we're probably going to do this, but in Matthew chapter 16, it's the same story, just from a different perspective, a, a different author's perspective. But but we see here that this, this group called the Pharisees is present. The, the Pharisees come, and, and they're going to have another discussion with Jesus. Now, mind you, y'all, this is all public. As we've walked through this, as we've seen, like, Jesus has become a very popular individual, right? Like, he, he is drawing massive crowds everywhere he was going. If people knew Jesus was going to be there, if they knew Jesus was coming, like, they were coming, they were flocking. Like, people who were sick, people who were hurting, people who were in desperate need of something, looking for miracles, they were there to see Jesus. People who, who were interested in what, the, what Jesus had to say, all of his, his teachings, all that kind of stuff. Like, he is drawing massive crowds, okay? Um, and we see that in those, those, those healing, in those those, those miracles of him feeding the 5,000, feeding the 4,000, right? And so Jesus drawing big crowds. In this particular case, these Pharisees, which were religious leaders. These were the religious leaders of the day. But these were the ones that would instruct people on how to worship. These were, um, it's, it's not a great necessarily picture to, to think of them as the pastors of the day, but in some regards they were. They, they, were the, they were the individuals that oftentimes people look to for spiritual leadership, right? They, they had lives that were marked by being different. Like they held a very high regard to the law. Like they were very much individuals who, who were, were checking boxes, that, that were doing things visibly that made them look different. Like they were very much individuals who were focused, hyper-focused on external things, as we'll see here. They come to Jesus and they have this question, really a demand. If, if, if you look at what they say, the Pharisees came. And again, if you look at, at Matthew or Mark, Matthew, I'm sorry, 16, it was the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. 
right? Um, we may address that a little bit later, but they come and, and notice what it says in verse 11. It says, seeking for him a sign from heaven to test him. Like this was not a, a situation where, where, where they're unsure of who Jesus is and, and they're going to ask for Jesus to give some kind of sign to, to help them understand uh, some kind of sign that would, 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 would verify, validate his ministry, who he was. Like the, the key statement in there is they're, they're doing that to test him. Like they don't believe Jesus is the son of God. They don't believe what Jesus is teaching, what Jesus is preaching. That they're not big, strong proponents of his grace, of his compassion, his mercy, and his love. And so they're going to ask, they're going to demand a sign. Now, y'all, listen, if, if, if you read Mark, you read the Gospels, like, like has Jesus already shown signs? We've seen all sorts of miracles, haven't we? Right? I mean, we've, we've seen deaf people get their hearing back. People with speech impediments, be able to, to speak again. Man with a withered hand, like the withered hand taken away, like brand new hand, all functions, everything works. We've seen blind people get sight. We've seen multiple people have demons cast out. Like, like Jesus and his earthly ministry can do some amazing things, like bring people back from the dead. Amazing thing, like feed, right? I mean, Feeding 5,000, which we, when we talk about it, like the, the crowd really wasn't 5,000. It's probably upwards of 20,000 people with a little boy's lunch and then having leftovers. Last week when we did the 4,000, same thing. Like the, the disciples have seven loaves of bread. They have, they have seven Hawaiian rolls, all right? And Jesus is able to take those seven Hawaiian rolls and feed not the 4,000, but probably like the 18,000 that were there. And then there's seven baskets left over. Like Jesus has, has shown miraculous signs already. But these religious leaders come in and, and, and they're demanding like a sign from heaven. In, in, in their minds, like what Jesus has done, this is kind of crazy to think about, but, but what Jesus has done thus far, like miracle wise, like that's minor league stuff. And now, now they're coming to Jesus is like, hey, if, if you really are who you say you are, it's time to step up your game. Like, I, I, we want real miracles. Like, like, they're wanting, like, the Elijah, like, fire straight down from heaven miracle. And, and I want you guys to see Jesus' response in verse 12. And it says he sighed deeply. He sighed deeply. Like, like this is not, okay, You guys, I know, are way, way more mature than I am in many ways, probably in all ways. Um, and, and, and many of you guys can have conversations and be part of things that, that and, and receive, like, conversation that maybe isn't going your way. Um, here's, here's what I'm unfortunately known for and my family will probably attest to this, is, is if I get into those conversations, I am, I, I'm pretty good at an eye roll. Anybody else eye roll? Like, it, it starts coming like, oh, here we go again. Here we go, right? And then, and usually what happens is this, when, when the eyes roll, like, the ears are turned off. I'm not listening, right? I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm too busy rolling my eyes, and what we see here is, like, Jesus isn't eye-rolling. Like, this, I think there's, there's some, some feelings of some frustration in here. But, but really, like, when, when he sighs, like, I, I, he's grieving. He, he's grieving because these are people, really, like, these Pharisees, they've been brought up in church. Like, they, 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 they know the law. Like, they know their Old Testament. Like, they should know better. Like, like, the Old Testament points to Jesus. Jesus is there in the flesh before them. But they've completely missed it. And he's been going around. And, and when we see these miracles, when Jesus performed a miracle, it was not to entertain the crowd. It, it was not to draw bigger crowds. Y'all, it, it, it was not to try to, 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 to swindle people. It was not to try to kind of push people over the edge. When Jesus performed miracles, there, there, was, there was primarily two purposes for it. One, to demonstrate God's power. And the second part, to show God's grace and mercy. 
That was it. He, he, he didn't do those things to try to coerce people to follow him. And so as these religious leaders come to him, demanding, testing him with a sign to, to show his authority, he sighs. He's grieving. And he, he, he makes this statement here. He says, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. In, in, in Mark, or I'm, I'm sorry, in Matthew, I'll go ahead and I'm, I'm going to read the, Matthew's perspective of this because he adds a little bit more details. Remember when we talk about the, different, the differences between like Matthew and Mark? Matthew's a longer book. Matthew adds more detail. Like Mark is kind of like the bullet point guy, like short on detail, right? So, so in, in Matthew chapter 16, um, at the very beginning, starting in verse 1, it says, And the Pharisees and Sadducees came to test him, and they asked him to show him a sign from heaven. He answered, so Jesus answered them, When it is evening, you say, it will be, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. And, uh, an evil and an, an adulterous generation seeks for signs, but no sign will be given except or given to you except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. So, so, so Jesus, in essence, is saying to that crowd, like, Man, all you guys are looking for are signs. And he, he uses kind of that nature, like that, that thing some of us still do, right? Like red at night, or, right? sailor's delight, right? Red in the morning, sailor's warning. Or y'all remember those things? Like, like Jesus didn't use that terminology, but like he's saying like back then they do the same thing. He's like, listen, you guys look at these signs and you can interpret those things, but yet you want these kind of signs. He's like, I'm done. I'm not giving you these kind of signs. But he does mention one thing. He goes, I will ultimately said, I'll give you one sign. And he points to Jonah. Now, Jonah is famous for being in the belly of a whale or a fish for how many days? Three. Awesome. You guys are amazing, right? And so, like, so, so is Jesus going to go into a, a belly of a, of a fish? No, he's not. But what he's doing is he's pointing to an event that's going to happen very soon, right? The, the sign for those people that, that he'll ultimately give them is he's going to go to the cross. And he will, he will die on the cross. Why? Because he loves us. Because there was only way, one perfect sacrifice necessary for us. Right? So Jesus is going to die on the cross for our sins. So that we could kind of rebuild that bridge between us and God again. He's going to die. And, and, and how long will Jesus be in the grave? Three days, right? And then he comes back to life. And so it's, it's a picture of Jonah. And so, so what, what he does tell them in that sense is like, I'm not giving you signs right now, but there is a sign coming. The sad thing, I think, is, as Jesus is grieving, is he knows even with that amazing sign. And some of us think, y'all, like, if, if we were there, if we were present in that day, like, who could have witnessed that? Who in, in their right mind could have witnessed the torture that Jesus went through? Who, who in their right mind could have seen Jesus die and then all of a sudden him come back to life? Who, who in their right minds couldn't believe? Like, like who in their right minds could, could listen to Jesus preach? Right? In the case of the feeding of the 4,000, like he preached for three days. And then all of a sudden, Jesus, with those little Hawaiian rolls, feed everybody. Who in their right mind like, could, could, could be present, could see that, could hear that, and, and, and not follow him? Unfortunately, that was the case. And, and when we come to a point in our lives where, where we just want the signs and the wonders... Strain happens. Difficulty happens. And Jesus is, is sighing. He, he, he's upset. And, and he, in essence, says, this is a, a, a wicked generation, and I'm not going to play your games. And he leaves. He leaves. He doesn't try to barter with them. He doesn't try to convince them in other ways. Jesus can see into their heart. He realizes it's hard. And he leaves. So this, this, this first scene, we see Jesus and these religious leaders. The second scene that we're about to read, Jesus and the disciples are back in a familiar place in a boat. 
And watch what happens here. Verse 14. It says, now they had forgotten to bring bread. Y'all, like we've already talked about, like we've seen two miracles, right? Like y'all have an idea where like some of this might be going, right? They, they had forgotten to bring bread and they had only one loaf with them on board, uh, with them on the boat. Verse 15. And he cautioned them saying, watch out, beware the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. All right, so, so y'all, like, just picture the scene. They're, they're in the boat. They're, they're going across the sea. And apparently they realize that, that at that point, they only, have one, they only have one Hawaiian roll left. Like, how many disciples are there? Come on, let me hear your knowledge. How many disciples are there? Twelve, all right, plus Jesus. That's 13 people, right? How far is one Hawaiian roll going to go for 13 people? Like at our house, one Hawaiian roll doesn't cover one person, right? And so they're already in, they're, they're already in a little bit of a jam. And, and, and I don't, we don't see this. I'm just purely speculating. So don't, again, this is Chad's speculation. But a group of guys, and there's only one piece of bread, and I'm pretty sure as they're discussing why there's only one loaf of bread, they're probably arguing with who is supposed to fill the basket. Like, look, whose job was it to, 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 to fill our lunch baskets? I mean, y'all think about this for like, isn't this crazy? They're not, they're just a day or so removed from Jesus feeding 4,000 people, seven big, like laundry baskets of, of food left over. And all they grabbed was one loaf. Like, like somebody probably failed their, their responsibilities. But nonetheless, there's this, this, this discussion taking place. Jesus probably isn't necessarily part of that conversation, but he knows what's being said. He knows their hearts. He knows their minds. He knows, he, he knows what's, what's being said. And he turns to them, and he makes that statement. He goes, watch out. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. He makes that statement, and, and all of a sudden, like, those, the, the disciples now are connecting. They're, they're saying, oh, oh, he knows that we only have one piece of bread. Like their mind, y'all, their mind is completely, completely focused on their stomach, on their physical need. Now, were the disciples present at the feeding of the 5,000? Yes. Were the disciples present at the feeding of the 4,000? Yes. Like, do you think Jesus has proven to them at this point that he can, he can, satisfied their physical needs. Like he, he can provide for them. He, he, he can make bread for them. He, he can feed them. Like we're not talking thousands. Now we're talking 13 people. Like that's easy peasy lemon breezy for Jesus, right? I mean, these disciples have seen this and that, that first group was religious leaders. They were spiritually blind. Like, like those 12 guys in the boat, like, they're, they're just experiencing like amnesia. Like they're experiencing maybe a, a temporary blindness, if you will. Like they, they've, they've fallen asleep. They've experienced all these amazing things of Jesus in these moments, but yet they've somehow in their moment of need forgotten. And Jesus is trying to make a much deeper lesson but yet they can't get past their stomachs. Verse 17, and Jesus, aware of this, said to them, why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? I mean, I, I, almost, I almost think like Jesus. Like, at this point, it might be the eye roll. Right? Like, when, when they start discussing about not having bread, like, I almost wonder, like, Jesus rolling his eyes now, because he's like, man, these numbskulls. Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Like, this is a series of questions here. Like, like first he's saying, like, why are you discussing that you don't have any bread? Um, do you not perceive? Do you not understand? Like, Apparently they don't, right? Um, 
Are your hearts hardened? Sadly, yes. Uh, Verse 18, having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke five loaves for 5,000 and how many baskets full of uh, pieces did you take up? And they said to him, 12. Verse 20, and the, tw- and the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of uh, broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? And Jesus walks through this. And you guys have eyes, but, but can you not see? You guys, you guys have ears, I'm, I'm, but apparently you're not listening. Like you have hearts, but they're hard. You don't understand. You've been watching, you've been walking with me in the midst of all of this. Jesus was trying to teach them a lesson, not about physical bread. He he was trying to send or use this as a moment of, of instruction. Like when, when, you, when you go back to his initial statement to them, right? Um, when in verse 15, he says, watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Like he realized that, that they lacked bread. And so he wanted to use that as, as, a, as, a, as a symbol, as, 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 a, as an illustration. And, and I, I am by no means a bread maker. I'm a bread eater. I like lots of bread, but I don't, I've never, I've never made bread unless putting toast in a toaster is making warm bread. That's about as much as I can do. But, but here, like he's using this idea, this, this illustration. Now, now when we think about this idea, like sometimes we think of, of yeast and maybe if you're a baker, you're familiar with yeast, you put that in the recipe and it causes the, 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 the bread to puff up. But, but really it's a deeper it, it, it's something I think even even better. Um, I'm not going to name names. They can they can declare themselves later. But apparently, someone in our church has taken up the art of making sourdough bread. She shall remain nameless, but she's in the third row. Um, and so, I, again, I know nothing about this, and I'm going to probably even botch this up. And so, if I do, I do whatever. Um, but <coughs> the other night we're me and, and the family are talking about it. And, and I'm, I was just a little, whatever, inquisitive. I don't, I don't know. And, and they started talking about like a like starter for bread. And I just, in my mind, I, I thought it was just like, Hey, there's ingredients, you know, whatever, mix it all up, throw it in an oven and boom, you have oven like, like cookies, right? Like, I mean, that's, but apparently there's a lot more to it. And so there's this starter thing. And, and, and so more Courtney, I think, and the girls were telling me, like, you have to create the starter, and then, and, and then you, it grows, and, and you have to, like, feed it, right? And, um, as it, I guess, it ferments, if that's the right terminology, right? So, but, but, but listen, y'all, like, it's the same process they're using back here. Like, like they didn't have little yeast packets. Like, what they would do when they, when they would take and make this bread, they would create their dough, and they would take a pinch of the dough from yesterday, like their, I guess their starter, and they would put it into this this new dough, and then, and then that 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 starter would begin to affect the rest of that dough and cause it to to grow to 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 puff up. I mean, I was thinking like, man, like what what he's what he's telling those disciples in that moment is like, y'all, like like be careful, be be, be careful of 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 the the Pharisees like leaven, like be careful of the the Pharisees like sourdough starter kit, right? Be careful of, of, of Herod's sourdough starter kit or whatever it, it is, right? Because it, it, it will, when you mix it in your dough, it's going to affect it. it. It will take over. But, and I, I love the idea of this, like that, that starter doesn't just, just happen. Like, like it takes time and, and you have to feed it to help it grow. But a little bit goes a long way and a little bit will completely change the other dough. 
And that's the point Jesus is trying to make to the disciples. In the midst of, of them being focused on their stomachs, in the midst of them having lacking complete faith that Jesus can take care of them, they're missing this, this lesson where he says, like, watch out, be aware. Like, don't allow those things in your life because if you allow that into your life, it's going to change you. If, if you're going to allow those Pharisees and their self-righteousness and their pride and their arrogance, their spiritual arrogance, if you're going to allow that to, 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 to be part of you, it's going to grow. It's going to consume you. And, and if, you don't, if you're not careful, you'll turn into that. The, the, the faith won't be about a relationship with a Savior. It'll be about your own works. It'll be about yourself. The, the, the picture of Herod, Herod wasn't a spiritual or religious individual. He's a, a political figure. It's a, it's a picture of, of, of what this world has to offer. And again, if you're going to allow those things, if you're going to allow that starter of what this world is 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 creating. If all your needs are going to be built upon what society is telling you is important. I'm going to say this probably at nauseum for many of you. But you look around with social media. You look at, at the news, the 24-hour news cycles that we have. And the world is selling a, a false hope. And it has a destructive path. And Jesus is saying to those disciples, be careful. Like, watch out. Be on guard. Don't let that garbage into your lives. As I was kind of thinking through this and, and, and kind of on the, on the backside of a lesson we had with the youth on Wednesday night, I was, I was, I was kind of reminded or, 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 or driven to the thought. In these scenes, you have individuals who, who want all these signs. Like these spiritual leaders we've seen, like, and it was a test. It wasn't like it was a genuine request. But as we've walked through Many of Jesus' miracles, like, remember that, like, the day after he feeds the 5,000, like, the next day they want food again. And Jesus is like, come on. And they ask for a sign. Jesus is like, I just fed you yesterday. We live in a world that, like, wants signs and wants things and wants all these different blessings. Right? They'll sit and we'll pray and, like, man, like, Jesus, I'll believe in you or I'll give my life to you if, if you do X, Y, and Z for me. I'll, I'll continue to follow you if, if you continue to provide these things for me, if you help me out of all these situations and all these things. Listen, um, maybe later on when you have opportunity, go back in the Old Testament. Go back to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33 is on the heels of Moses being on Mount Sinai chapter before, while Moses is on Mount Sinai, while meeting with the Lord, God's crafting the, the, the Ten Commandments and all that stuff on those tablets. The people below, the, the ones who have been led out of Egypt, the, the ones who have saw God work in miraculous ways, right? Like, like the plagues, but God parting the Red Sea, God providing them manna, like food from heaven, like God doing incredible things, like giving them water out of rock. They collect all their jewelry or a portion of their jewelry and demand Aaron, who happens to be Moses' brother, demand that he build them a, an idol, a golden calf. And while Moses is up there and y'all like, Moses at the top of Mount Sinai, like it's, it's, it's surrounded by these clouds and, and lightning. And I mean, evident that something's going on up there. They take this idol and people begin to dance around it. The, the people declared that idol was what set them free, what, what brought them out of Egypt. Moses comes down, right? And 
y'all know the story. Like he's mad and he's upset. Like he, he drops those tablets, they break and all this. Now, now you, you fast forward to chapter 33. I'm going to read this for you. It says, the Lord said to Moses, depart, go up from here. You and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob saying to your offspring, I will give it. I will send an angel before you. I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go among you. You know, you, th- that first part, like, like, that sounds awesome, doesn't it? Like, I mean, he tells him, like, Moses, go. Like, like, like take, take the people. And here's what's going to happen. Like, you're going to take them to the land. A land that he describes as flowing with milk and honey. Like, the prime real estate. Like, like the best that the world had to offer. Like, you know, it's, it's, it, it is going to be amazing. It's awesome. It's like, whatever, like, seaside 30A property. It's yours. It's going to be yours. And yeah, it's, it's, it's got people on there now, but here's what's going to happen. I'm going to send an angel and I'm going to destroy. I'm going to, I'm going to knock out all of your enemies. This is like, you read like, this is awesome. Like, this is amazing. Like everything I want, like, like those lists of the things that I want, like land of milk and honey, enemies destroyed by an angel. Sign me up. This is awesome. I think God makes that statement, but I will not go with you. Listen, y'all, like one of the things we talk with the youth, and I, I think kind of goes in line with what we have here in today's lesson, is how many of us want the things that Jesus has to offer without Jesus? How many of us are, are, are striving just like, like, like we, we view Jesus, and we won't say this probably publicly, but, but we view Jesus as our Santa Claus. We make that list of all the things that we want or all the things that we need. We, we, we let him know all the struggles that we're facing. We, we want our exit strategy. We want him to, to get us out of the jam that we're in. But we don't necessarily need him. We just want freedom from. Man, the children of Israel, like, like you read like the, the 32 chapters of, of Exodus before, you probably think, man, they're all like, Let's go. Let's do it. I don't care if you're with us or not, Jesus, as long as we get all the perks. Verse 4 says this, When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. They mourned. The land without God was nothing. The defeating enemies without the Lord being with them meant nothing to them. In fact, as you, as you continue reading on there, in essence, what they say is like, like, God, we can't take one step without you. We can't take one step without you. Let me ask you guys that question. Do we live a life where we just say, God, like, like you're the prize. It's, it's, it's not what you can offer. It's not all the perks. It's you. Last week we shared these, some of these verses with you. Philippians 4, 19 says this, my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. That's a promise that Paul mentions there. He says he'll provide all your needs. Last week I used the phrase, it does not say that my God will supply all your greeds. See, what happens is this, like we set our eyes on something that we really want and if we don't get it, then all of a sudden we we get mad at God. The the promise that's given to us is God will supply all of our needs. A few verses before that, Paul writes this. This is is amazing. 
Because I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, right? So Philippians 4, like, like 12 says, like Paul says, like I've, I've learned, I've learned, I've learned to find my contentment, which is something so many are chasing today, right? And he's like, I can be content whether, whether I'm hungry or I'm full. I, I can be content whether my bank account is full or empty. Like my contentment is not found in circumstance or situation. Verse 13 tells us, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things, not in my own resources, not in my own strengths, not in my own talents or abilities. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Like that's the key to contentment, y'all. The key to contentment is realizing like it's all through Christ. It's all through him. I just wonder for us today as we wrap this thing up, as we look at different perspectives, religious leaders who are just spiritually blind, who who, who just want signs and wonders, or we like the disciples who are just forgetful and forget all the amazing things that God has done in the past. We forget promises that we've read like this. We, we forget that, that Jesus loved us so much. Loved us so much. John three sixteen says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Now just, just, just for a moment, if Jesus loved you so much, enough that he was willing to die on the cross for your sins, do you think he's just going to forget you? Do you think he doesn't care about you? Isn't concerned with the things that you're facing and the things that you're going through? Do we love Jesus for the things he brings? Or do we just love Jesus for him? See, the thing I, I shared with the youth on Wednesday, some people look at salvation, a relationship with Jesus. Like they look at like the, the prize is when I die, and my, my last breath on earth or my next breath will be in heaven. Like they think like, like that's the prize. If I ask Jesus into my life, like the prize is I get to go to heaven for eternity. Y'all, that is not the prize. That is a prize, but it's not the prize. That is a benefit. The prize, and do not ever forget this, the prize is Jesus. The prize is a relationship with Jesus. That is the prize the savior of the universe, the one who created everything, the one who died. Like he is offering you a relationship with him. That starts the moment you say yes to him and it will last for eternity. Let's pray.